Uh, I'll be presenting uh, a compilation of Julia code for deployment in model-based engineering workflows uh, on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Frederick Carlson. Um, so we'll begin by uh, walking through uh, the Julia compilation pipeline to set the stage. Then I'll cover how uh, AOT compilation of Julia has historically worked, uh, where we are now, and where we are headed. We'll then look at two demos, one that uh, compiles a Julia-based executable for state estimation, and another that turns a Julia PID controller into a shared library that can be called from C. And finally, we'll discuss the current limitations of the workflow. Julia typically compiles just ahead of time, or JIT. The process starts with a uh, source code which goes through type inference and optimization. This is followed by uh, generating LLVM intermediate IRs, uh, then LLVM optimization, and finally producing native code for your target architecture, such as x86-64 or ARM. The point here is uh, Julia isn't traditionally ahead of time compiled, but that's changing. So historically, you had two options to distribute Julia programs. One was to simply distribute the source code, which of course requires a Julia installation. The other was to bundle everything into a giant binary, so your source, compile code, uh, Julia and LLVM compilers, and uh, the runtime. So this gave you a self-contained artifact with full language features intact, but it was huge, um, multiple GBs, and not always relocatable. Yep. Um. So now, and uh, specifically in the near future, we are taking a more refined approach. We trim everything that's unreachable from the entry point. If there's anything we can't compile, like calls to eval or code with unbounded types, we complain. This means that we can guarantee uh, that what you get is actually ahead of time compiled. For example, uh, a hello world can now be under one MB, and we lose a few dynamic features like eval, but most of the language is still usable. What you're uh, seeing on the left is our toy function. Um, it generates a two by two matrix. If A is less than zero, then computes its sign. On the right, we are uh, inspecting uh, the method instance of this function using code warn type. What this shows us is what the compiler sees, the inferred types. This is useful because it reveals a few key things about uh, ahead of time compilation. We can see here that all the types are fully inferred. This is impor important because in AOT, everything must be known and concrete at compile time. If there's any ambiguity, say from dynamic dispatch or eval, compilation will fail or generate inefficient code. So uh, is this okay? Well, if your code is written in a way that the compiler can reason about everything statically, uh, that's the deal with uh, AOT compilation in Julia. If the compiler can see through your code all the way down to the types, you're good. Otherwise, it won't work. So part of the workflow becomes writing Julia code that's compatible, and that's a slightly more constrained subset of what the language allows at runtime. So let's look at two concrete demos. First, we'll create an executable for model-based state estimation. Um, this uses equation-based modeling and standard Julia libraries. The second, we'll compile a PID controller library into a shared object and call it from a C program. So in the first demo, uh, which is the model-based state estimation, uh, what you're seeing here is a typical example from control engineering. We've got an equation-based model. In this case, the continuously stirred tank reactor and we're gonna build a state estimator for it. So this combines two powerful Julia tools, a uh, modeling toolkit for symbolic equation-based modeling and a standard Julia package for state estimation. In this case, uh, the uh, static Kalman filter. So the source is available through the QR code. Uh, the key idea is to use standard Julia tools uh, and compile this into a standalone executable. So it loads the data file and runs the filter. So this demonstrates how you can take something very high level uh, and bring it all the way down to a, like a deployable binary. So we're working with a continuously stored 
tank reactor or CSTR. For those who aren't familiar, CSTR is a common benchmark system in control and chemical engineering. It's basically a tank where a chemical reaction takes place with fluid flowing in and out, and everything is constantly stirred to maintain uniformity. This kind of system is nonlinear and time varying, making it a good candidate for demonstrating state estimation. So we define the model symbolically using modeling toolkit.jl and then call a generate control function to generate Julia code for uh, simulation or estimation. So from a high level symbolic description of the physics, we are now producing concrete Julia functions that can be compiled and deployed. Once we've defined the model and generated the Julia code, we compile it into a binary. The workflow here is include the generated Julia code, discretize it, define the state estimator, and run the filter on measurement data. Here's what we get. The binary is about 3.5 MB, and uh, when we run it, it finishes in 27 milliseconds, or that the actual filtering step just takes about 62 microseconds. So this demonstrates that you can take a symbolic model, generate and compile it, and run real-time state estimation in a highly performant way with a very small uh, deployment footprint. So uh, this next demo shows how a Julia package, in this case discrete PIDs, um, can be compiled into a shared library and used directly from a C program. So unlike the previous example, which produced an executable, this flow compiles the Julia code into a shared object file, and that shared library can then be loaded and called from C, making it easy to integrate Julia-based control logic into external environments without needing to run a Julia session. It's a simple but powerful way to bring high-level Julia functionality into low-level systems. So to make uh, the Julia functions callable from C, they're annotated with C callable. So this macro exposes them to C-compatible entry points, which allows external programs to link against them, just like they would with any traditional C library. After compilation, the result is a shared object that's about 1.7 MB in size. That's relatively small and makes it practical for deployment in embedded systems or performance-sensitive environments. So the source code is, again, uh, available publicly on GitHub, um, on the QR code shown. Once the shared object has been compiled, it can be loaded and used from a C program. This is done by linking the C program to libjulia, which is Julia's runtime uh, shared library. The compiled Julia code relies on this at runtime, so the C application needs to load both the PID control library and the Julia runtime. So this setup works today, but it's important to note that the binary is not yet fully self-contained. Uh, you will still need to ship libjulia alongside your application, but there's some manual configuration involved. That said, this is a practically functioning pipeline that shows how Julia code can be embedded and reused from C. So the same compilation and deployment approach works on resource-constrained platforms like the Raspberry Pi. The executable runs about four times slower on the Pi compared to a typical laptop but that still leaves plenty of room for real-time or near real-time applications. At the moment, there's no first-class support for cross-compilation, so the recommended options are to either compile directly on Raspberry Pi or use an emulator. There are still a few limitations to be aware of. First, the Julia runtime is still required, so this only works on platforms Julia supports, um, like uh, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and common architectures such as x86-64, um, ARMv7, um, uh, v8, and RISC-V. There's no support yet for real-time operating systems or deeply embedded targets like Arduino. Uh, the runtime itself is not yet trimmed, and cross-compilation remains an open issue. Also, these features haven't been officially released yet. They're still under active development. That said, all of these areas are still being actively worked on, and improvements are expected in upcoming Julia versions. So the natural question is, uh, should this workflow be used today? And the answer is, it depends. So for people who are deeply familiar with Julia, 
and comfortable working with close to the internals, possibly building custom tool chain or debugging low level issues, it may be worth exploring. But for most users, especially those looking for stable, streamlined experience, it's probably best to wait until this is officially released and supported. So to summarize, Julia code can now be ahead of time compiled into a relatively small um, binary or shared libraries. So most language features are preserved, though highly dynamic features like eval or unbounded dispatch aren't uh, supported. These capabilities aren't yet available in a stable Julia release, but support is very close. Um, this has practical implications for reducing the size of Julia FMUs and deploying Julia models more e efficiently. And finally, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to reach out. Yep. Okay, well, uh, we have plenty of time for questions, I think. So are there any, any out there? Here, okay. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, when you compile those codes and put in the Raspberry Pi, did you try to measure something like latency or let it execute for a very long period of time to check for memory leaks or something like that? Um, uh, Cody, do you have an answer for that? <laughs> so I, I'm not aware of any uh, specific late testing, although Frederick probably did do some. I just don't think we have them on hand right now. Uh, but specifically for allocations, I know that he was using allocheck uh, alongside this process to make sure that it doesn't have any usage of the GC either. Um, and so we don't expect anything like memory links or, or GC pauses to be an issue. Any, any other questions? There's one right here. Uh, regarding your first uh, example, um, do I get correctly that it, you, still, you still use the trim functionality to compile it, right? So it's, in essence, the difference between them is just like who calls Julia is it like main self self-generated by Julia or it's uh, foreign from C? Um, sorry, are you talking about the continuously stored reactor model? Yes, yeah, yeah, that one. Um, and uh, so I didn't get your question. Um, sorry, could you repeat that? So in, in that case, uh, what you show is um, essentially similar to the second example. Uh, so it also uses Julia runtime, right? Uh, yes. Uh, but um, so the first case is, um, or more to say, the second case is building a shared object file, and the first case is an actual executable. So, um, uh, is, is okay. So that's the only difference between them. Yeah. Okay, I didn't get it. And uh, I don't know, uh, Cody. Do you want to? Uh, right. Okay. Oh. All right. Uh, one, one thing, it's, it's not really a question, sorry, uh, but if somebody's interested in uh, this, we at ASML actually use it. So we have a talk today at uh, 2.30 and tomorrow at 11.30 uh, where we will talk in uh, details like performance, uh, interaction with the system, and, and so on. If you want to find them, I'm Yuri. You can find my talks. I'm participating in both. Cool, yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll find you. Yeah, we try to use it in a real environment in the production. So hmm. it's, it's, I, I, I agree with your um, summary that it's not that like production ready if you don't want to invest in it, but uh, it's possible if you invest in it. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other, uh, any other questions? Um, okay, all right, well, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.